Okay, hello and welcome back or welcome for the first time if you're joining us now. My name is Michael. I work for Finanzwende, that's a German civil society organization working on financial change. Together with the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, we are organizing this conference, Next Generation Central Banking. And um, yeah, we've already had a couple of discussions earlier on financial stability and uh, then joined into, jumped into workshop uh, discussions on central bank digital currency, again, on financial stability and a little nerd talk around repo markets and then also what civil society and campaigns uh, can do to sort of um, try and mobilize around um, central bank policies. And right now we're shifting towards um, one of the other um, huge societal challenges that we have, which is inequality. So we'll be talking about monetary policy and inequality in this uh, final debate of tonight. And uh, yeah, usually when talking about inequality, people often think about taxes and fiscal policy, but we really want to zone in tonight on what role um, monetary policy actually plays. And uh, yeah, joining us today are two wonderful speakers from the world of central banking. We have uh, Mr. Vitor Constancio, who was the ECB's vice president from 2010 to 2018, and previously the governor of the Portuguese Central Bank. And um, um, I was told to speak a little slower. Um, he will speak on monetary policy and inequality and present um, right after I've uh, started here. So first of all, hello, uh, Mr. Constancio. Oh. And then uh, we have Pierre Monat, who is actually helping us uh, co-organize this conference and has been super helpful with that. And he's also a senior fellow at the Council of Economic Policies, where he focuses on monetary policy. And previously he was with the Swiss National Bank in various roles for a total of 10 years, I think. And he will present just following um, Mr. Consencio. And so we have uh, two presentations here at the beginning, and then we'll jump into a Q&A and I will facilitate the discussion, have a couple of questions prepared to get the conversation kicked off. And then we will collect all your questions in the Q&A. And uh, we are also recording this session. So yes, it will be available uh, to see this later on. And um, yeah, without further ado, we can uh, jump in and Mr. Constancio, if you want, you can start sharing your screen. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I uh, want to um... Thank the organizers for inviting me, showing uh, a willingness for a broad dialogue, which I share uh, by accepting, I really share the same um, willingness on a very important topic, as we all know, because uh, I think that together with climate change uh, is uh, one of the biggest challenges that uh, our societies uh, confront. Um, and uh, it's then uh, no wonder that uh, central banks have been put also under scrutiny regarding this uh, this uh, question. Uh, this is my outline, not very important because it's a short uh, presentation. Um, uh, and I start precisely with uh, the uh, 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 pointing to the fact that. Uh, what draws more attention to uh, the potential role of central banks in this question of uh, inequality are two uh, beliefs uh, that are quite spread. First, that uh, stock price developments are mostly determined by monetary policy and that uh, stock or bonds uh, valuations unconditionally overwhelm are the drivers of wealth uh, uh, inequality. So that would put the central banks at the center of this, uh, of this problem. Uh, as you uh, could perhaps uh, uh, foresee, I don't share uh, these uh, views because, uh, uh, well, in the first place, I have that chart uh, there, which is a very crude way of just pointing that it would be impossible econometrically to show uh, a big influence of uh, interest rates uh, in the blue line uh, on developments of uh, stock prices. 
it's all over the place. Uh, the correlation uh, over time is uh, is quite uh, small because uh, uh, stock prices depend on many many uh, other uh, factors, of course. Uh, and and good empirical work that I will try to um, allude to uh, uh, show that monetary policy impact on both income and wealth inequality is quite complex with uh, uh, positive and negative effects. And generally from that evidence, the result is that the uh, overall effect is small, not really very significant. It's also meaningful, I think, to point out that uh, in the very well-known books of Piketty, Atkinson, Yanovsky, uh, or Walter Scheidel, uh, monetary policy or interest rates are not uh, pointed as a big cause of uh, uh, time trends of distribution uh, and uh, are not uh, also in the set of measures that they propose to correct income and wealth uh, uh, inequality. Nevertheless, uh, it's an important subject. Income distribution has a two-way relationship with monetary policy because the transmission of monetary policy is affected by income distribution. And fortunately, we, now, we have now many uh, macroeconomic models uh, with heterogeneous uh, agents uh, that show that uh, uh, indeed the, the macroeconomic developments influence distribution, but also distribution influences macroeconomic uh, developments. There are even papers trying to show that inequality was one of the causes of the uh, 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 big recession uh, of the financial crisis in 2008 to 2009, and certainly it had uh, an effect. So central banks cannot ignore this. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, main literature, oh, oh, sorry, how can I go back? Yeah, I'm sorry. As I was saying, the uh, literature shows that the main factors that over time explain the main trades, uh, the main trends of uh, uh, income and wealth distribution are uh, the skill buyers of technical change, globalization, decline of uh, labor unions, education levels, population aging, the decline in um, and the uh, uh, tax rates, both on, on personal income and inheritance uh, taxes. And then are also looking quite broadly, uh, and I quote there from that book from Shido, uh, the great leveler, violence and the history of inequality from the stone age to the 21st century, points to uh, what it calls the four horsemen of leveling and the uh, distributions, which uh, it identifies analyzing different uh, uh, periods uh, as being wars, uh, transformative revolutions, state failures, and little pandemics. Uh, and we could have perhaps hyperinflation, which uh, has happened only at national level, but certainly has also a big effect on uh, distribution. So we see there for the United States uh, in his chart, uh, the evolution of uh, income inequality, inequality measured by sort of Gini coefficient, uh, where wars and the big depression of the 30s and the uh, wake of the buildup of the welfare state in Europe after the Second World War, um, commands the big drives of uh, the trend of the distribution with the big uh, reversal that started to happen since the 1980s uh, uh, after Thatcher and Reagan uh, governments and the change in macroeconomics or economic theory to the new classics. Now, the same sort of uh, overall trends are shown by the um, uh, these charts uh, taken from uh, Piketty's uh, last book, which he shares in that uh, uh, link that I put there, that uh, indicate uh, for first for uh, Europe and the US, 
the evolution uh, of the share of the 10 mo most rich uh, segment of the population uh, in, income, uh, in income distribution. And we see that uh, indeed wars, the big recession, the uh, period after the war of the big leveling and the reversal starting in the 80s. And the same is true also about uh, uh, wealth inequality, where we see in both that this uh, reversal has uh, uh, influenced much more the developments in the US than in Europe or uh, European countries. Uh, and that has to do, of course, uh, mostly with redistribution uh, policies. Um, now, uh, turning to trying to uh, uh, then go into uh, the discussion of some papers and analysis of uh, income and wealth distribution in the euro area. Here I show the composition of uh, uh, income by uh, quartiles in the euro area, uh, which now comes regularly from a survey of households, uh, finance, uh, and uh, consumption. And as we see there regarding income, the lowest uh, uh, quintile uh, there, uh, which is made of the poorest people, where uh, many uh, retirees uh, are important. The pensions have a big chunk in uh, the composition of uh, the income in this quintile. Whereas in the top quintile, uh, in the top quintile, we see employment income and self-employment uh, uh, income, and also the pensions still there, and also the importance of financial income for the overall composition of income of these uh, top uh, quartile. And uh, now for uh, wealth, uh, we see uh, for the top uh, quintile, the importance of stocks, of shares, uh, in the composition of total wealth of this quintile, and then the self-employment businesses, uh, the household main residence and other real estate, and the same for the other quintiles. And we see that uh, the importance of housing and real estate is really overwhelming, particularly in what regards the middle of the distribution. So, uh, the prices of uh, uh, financial assets and stocks in particular could have to increase much, much, much more than the prices of houses, which is true, they have increased more. Um, but indeed to uh, lead to a deterioration of the uh, distribution of the indicators of the uh, uh, distribution. Uh, and. Uh, when we uh, then look to this list of uh, um, academic papers dealing with the, the issue, I don't have time to go through these papers, and there are more, of course. Um, you find the reference at the end uh, in the last slide. Uh, what we can conclude is that uh, um, contracts in what regards income distribution, a restrictive uh, monetary policy uh, deteriorates the distribution, increases inequality, whereas expansionary monetary policy uh, reduces uh, in inequality, which is understandable. And it has much to do uh, with the uh, fluctuations of employment and unemployment. Um, regarding the wealth, uh, the picture is a little more mixed. Uh, that paper by Fuseri and uh, others, Fuseri from the IMF, um, shows that indeed that's uh, true for the income distribution, the impact of monetary policy in what regards uh, uh, wealth inequality, they find for 30, 32 countries that uh, inequality um, uh, deteriorates a bit in the short term on impact, but uh, uh, improves uh, is reduced in the medium term. Um, there is the last paper, which is uh, well quite quoted for good reasons. It comes from the BIS, um, which 
points in a more um, significant way to the guilt of monetary policy in the deterioration uh, of uh, distributions. Um, but uh, indeed, uh, is a paper uh, that does not have the methodology, does not try to measure the, or quantify the impact of monetary policy on each of the variables that determine the uh, distribution either of income or uh, wealth. So it just analyzes the evolution of these different val variables, employment, wages, financial income, uh, uh, stock prices, housing prices, and concludes that uh, ones have increased more than others. And uh, as a qualitative assumption, that monetary policy is uh, in the end responsible for what happened uh, or mostly responsible for what happened to those prices, but not, does not try to uh, do any econometrics to substantiate uh, uh, that. Uh, so that is uh, a very brief review of the literature. Now I focus on the uh, other uh, paper that was mentioned there, which is uh, ECB working paper uh, of 2018 that uses uh, the uh, information about composition of income and wealth, and then uses a uh, Bayesian uh, uh, vector of a regressive uh, uh, model of uh, 25 variables, try to quantify what uh, uh, is the shock, the effect after four periods of a monetary shock uh, in interest rates that would reduce the slope of the yield curve as a result of QE. So it's about the effect only of unconventional uh, measures on uh, the uh, uh, yield curve, on the slope of the uh, yield curve, on the spread between long rates and uh, short-term rates, and the effect on the, the relevant variables. And the result is that uh, because of the effects of monetary policy on unemployment or unemployment, uh, uh, unemployed people coming to uh, become employed, indeed the effect on the lowest quintile is the biggest one. And this is in percentage of the initial level of the income of the different quintile, which is here below. So it's in the percentage, which is what counts, as I will show in a minute. Uh, and we see uh, here that financial income is important for the uh, uh, top uh, quintile and also for this one. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, that's uh, what comes from the uh, uh, VAR model that they use to quantify the effects of monetary policy. And the same for housing prices and stock prices. And uh, uh, as a result of the composition and the relative importance of houses, they also find that uh, the wealth in percentage of the initial level uh, of the lowest uh, uh, quintile increases more as a result of the shock uh, coming from the uh, uh, large purchases uh, of securities, QE, um, increases more than uh, the other uh, quintiles. The difference between the two uh, bars is that the light blue uh, uses a uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, putting that the houses that are more expensive uh, from the top uh, um, quintile would react more to uh, monetary policy than less expensive houses. But even with that uh, sensitivity analysis, the uh, outcome is similar. And as this is in percentage, it means that the Gini coefficient, uh, both of income distribution and uh, wealth distribution would improve very marginally. And it's not the, the, the main point for me, at least, uh, because this is in some ways a narrow exercise, uh, uh, shock coming from the effects of QE, and the impact over four periods of uh, that shock. Uh, so it doesn't matter exactly the numbers or the final uh, results. What matters in my view is that again, it shows that the overall effects of monetary policy per se 
uh, offset uh, different uh, contributions and uh, are in the end not very big. Uh, and that's perhaps why also, as I said, in the literature about what to do to correct the big problem that now our societies have, uh, monetary policy doesn't show up uh, normally in those books or uh, analyses. And it's, uh, I apologize very much for this slide, but I, in my experience, I find that it is uh, useful, nevertheless, for uh, some of us uh, who do not go deeper into these questions of, of inequality, why is it uh, that it is the percentage variation of each uh, segment uh, in their uh, green tiles that matters for the uh, uh, measures of inequality. So uh, here I have uh, for uh, here um, I have four quartiles. Um, uh, no, sorry, here I have green tiles and I had quartiles in the first in the other in the other uh, charts. And it's just uh, you know uh, numbers I put down. Uh, in moment T, and then an increase uh, uh, for the next period, and the absolute increase of the top uh, of the top uh, um, uh, quartile here uh, is uh, seven times more, or more than seven times the increase in the first uh, um, uh, quartile. Um, but if we use any simple measures of inequality in the first distribution and the second, we see that both the top low ratio, um, quartile four over quartile one improves slightly, the Gini coefficient also improves. And also if we just measure the part of the top uh, quartile in the total, it also improves. And the explanation is of course, that the increases in percentage that I put there were bigger in the first quartile, sec bigger than the second, the third, and the fourth, and it is the percentage that counts. Just to explain what comes out of uh, uh, some of the literature about the effects of uh, monetary policy on distributions. So uh, we have to look indeed to other policies. Uh, one uh, is surely uh, taxation. Um, here, there is this interesting uh, chart from uh, Piketty, uh, the recent book and uh, that site that shows the top marginal rates of the income tax in these countries. And we see that after the war and the buildup uh, in the mood of the buildup of the uh, uh, welfare state, uh, what we could call the uh, social democratic moment uh, in Europe in particular, uh, top, you know, top marginal interest rates were very, very high, but then uh, they start to go down very sharply where they are uh, now. And that has, uh, of course, has had an effect. Uh, overall, tax and transfers affect very much the distribution. In orange, uh, we have there the effect of uh, taxes and transfers in correcting the uh, distribution that comes from market uh, outcomes. Uh, and we see that for these European countries here represented, just a simple average uh, shows that the redistribution has uh, uh, reduced the uh, market outcome uh, inequality from year to year by 21 percentage points. Whereas for instance, in the US was only 13. Um, so we know this, of course, but we also know that uh, indeed to correct this uh, big challenge, big problem that is affecting everything in our societies, we need to have measures that uh, uh, start at the pre redistribution phase that affect the market out outcomes themselves. Uh, without that, uh, more progress uh, will not be uh, significant, um, particularly because this pandemic, contrary to the little pandemics that Scheidel was referring to, this pandemic is contributing 
to an increase, uh, a further increase in inequality. Um, from the uh, uh, book of Catechism that I mentioned before, in the end, he lists 15 proposals uh, of measures to deal with uh, uh, um, in, uh, inequality. I have listed here 12, seven that uh, have to do with redistribution measures and uh, then some redistribution measures. And the measures are uh, in terms of the uh, situation uh, in our societies are bold. We cannot say that they are not bold uh, from uh, uh, sharing profits with workers to uh, capital endowments uh, to uh, uh, governments uh, offering guaranteed employment at the living uh, at the living wage to everyone who seeks it that the uh, European Union should introduce a universal basic income for children which is slightly different from the idea of a universal basic income which I don't subscribe I have also some doubts about the guaranteed jobs but uh, uh, on the whole uh, then uh, increasing sharply the uh, marginal rates of uh, income taxation to 65%, uh, higher property taxes, an annual wealth tax and a global tax regime based on total wealth. Uh, you see all these uh, set of proposals, it doesn't include anything about uh, monetary policy as I mentioned already. And nevertheless, in spite of this type of proposals, uh, Atkinson uh, estimates what would be the likely effect in the UK of four major measures. Uh, income taxes, earned income discount at low income levels, substantial taxable benefits paid out for his child, and a minimum income for all citizens. And these four major measures calibrated around the, the levels that he uh, considers would improve, nevertheless, the Gini coefficient uh, uh, only uh, by 5.5 percentage points, uh, which is less than what it has increased in previous uh, decades. Uh, just, just points to the difficulty, uh, because if we look to this list of proposals, we see that uh, they would not be easy to uh, get uh, approval uh, in our present societies and shows the dimension of the task that our societies have before them. So what can we conclude? And that's my last slide about monetary policy. Well, uh, first I point out that uh, indeed in what regards income uh, in inequality, uh, that uh, there is consensus uh, in the uh, uh, econometric analysis that expansionary policies reduce uh, income inequality. And that expansionary and that restrictive uh, uh, increase inequality even further because the effects are asymmetric here. And also that the effects on wealth distribution is more mixed because there are more uh, um, countervailing uh, drives, but the majority view is also that the effects in the end are uh, on the small side. Uh, so what can be done? What are the questions then? Uh, in spite of this uh, conclusion, should monetary policy not have used QE in the previous uh, and recent uh, crisis? Uh, it's a big question because if the uh, belief that I mentioned uh, at the beginning is that it is monetary policy that commands stock prices and stock prices are the main uh, responsible driver of wealth inequality, then should we not do uh, QE? Should we not uh, address the uh, potential uh, big recession uh, that could uh, develop after, uh, uh, on the wake of these uh, two crises? I don't think so. And uh, well, we can discuss the degree of use of the policy, but certainly not the fact that it was very important to avoid the collapse of our economies. There is a broader, more pertinent debate uh, linked to this, which is sh should monetary policy target the smoothing out of asset prices over time in both directions as a sort of secondary objective of monetary policy? There was a big academic 
and uh, policy debate at the beginning of the 2000s. And the majority uh, of that debate answered no. It should be macroprudential regulatory measures that should deal with financial instability, credit booms, uh, and so on. Although it's more difficult to devise measures that could attain more directly the stock uh, market. Uh, yeah, Mr. Constanzio, maybe I, this I, is it. I am finishing these two ideas and I'm, I'm, I'm out. So, Nevertheless, there is a necessity for central banks to eliminate the notion that there is a policy put to protect at the significant stock price downfall, and uh, that uh, it should be uh, uh, it should be uh, implemented in increasing the importance of unemployment in the central bank's objective functions, condoning now uh, for a few years inflation above targets, uh, uh, which illustrates the advantages of having a dual mandate instead of a pure inflation targeting one, even if it's true that in this long period of low inflation, the two objectives tend to be aligned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Constantine. That was a lot of information and uh, quite detailed studies that you were looking at. I think that we can dive into that in the discussion uh, later on. And then now I would just uh, pass over quickly to, to Pierre Monin, who can uh, follow up with his thoughts and his presentation right now. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share my thoughts about uh, central banks and inequality. Um, I, mean, I mean, as it has been highlighted several times in this conference, uh, inequality and climate change are, are the big challenge for our generation. And, uh, and in facing that, I think that all policy institutions and all policymakers uh, must absolutely think afresh what their objectives are in, for the future and also how they operate to achieve them. And this, for me, includes central banks, which are no exception to this uh, rethinking. So though, that's why I think this conference is particularly timely. And thank you to Finance Vende and, and the Hisbrun Foundation for taking the initiative to, to organize it. Um, let me share my, my uh, slide. Can you see it? So, so, yes, before, yes. Yeah. so before I, I spend the next, uh, I will spend the next 15 minutes uh, a bit differently than that Mr. Consocio did and, and just to present you how I think uh, central banks can better address growing inequality and that without jeopardizing their current mandate and actually by actually remaining in their, in their current mandate. And, and before I start, just, may, just let me remind you one, uh, one important fact. Uh, this fact is that all monetary policy has distributional effect. Uh, this is uh, acknowledged by all central bankers I know. We can discuss whether it's big or not, in which direction it goes, but actually monetary policy work, works through distributional effects. So that's, that's not contested. And for me, this, is, this raises three questions. Uh, what, the first one is, do all monetary policy have, the similar, have similar distributional effect? Here, I think the answer is now, and I differ a bit from what was presented before, and I will explain why. And, and if not all policies have similar distributional effect, then the question comes, which one to choose for central banks? Uh, are there some better than others? And, and here, here I will argue that central bank choose, should choose one monetary policy that have the, the greater impact on unemployment and low income. And that not because it's nice, but because it would actually help them fulfilling their mandate in terms of inflation and help them controlling inflation. And I will explain you why. And the last question I would like to address is, can central bank implement uh, such a monetary policy uh, focused on job creation and, and supporting low wages? And, and I think the question in the current setting, how monetary policy is done, it's difficult, but I will try to give some some hints or some proposition on how they could do it better. So let me start first by just describing very quickly how monetary policy works that will help us understand how um, uh, inequality and, and distribution matters in that and how can central bank deal with this problem. So, so basically 
And, and I would focus on inflation, which is the mandate of all central banks. Other central banks can differ with secondary mandate, but I think they have in common to focus on inflation. So basically, monetary, central banks implement monetary policy to control inflation, to keep it not too low, not too high, and keep it in range. And, and for that, they basically try to shape demand and supply of goods in, in the economy. By the effect on, on, on demand and supply, then they have uh, kind of a lose control on, on inflation. Um, what we know from experience is that, uh, and central bank bankers know that, is that it's much easier for, for central banks to uh, shape demand, aggregate demand at supply. So central banks know how to deal with demand shock. They don't know, they have more difficulty to deal with, deal with supply shock. And they, and they, um, they have a better grasp on demand because um, monetary policy impact uh, relatively directly household income and thus their, their demand. Now, monetary policy doesn't come out of nothing. To implement monetary policy, central banks uh, use financial markets. And for that, they basically inject uh, central bank money or, or reserve in financial market at certain places. And, and then through financial markets, they have an impact on demand and supply and then on inflation. How does it how does it um, how does it work in terms of wealth and income? I, I just presented you the main categories of wealth. Mr. Consensio gave uh, gave us a more detailed picture before. What monetary policy does is basically, as I said, acting on financial markets, which has an impact on financial wealth and financial income in general. And they they how how they inject money in financial market then as an impact on relative asset prices. And, and uh, for example, changing the interest rate is a change in, in asset prices. This has, an indirect, this has an indirect impact on economic activities, which then has an impact on, on wages. So we see that monetary policy has a more direct impact on, on financial income than on wages. So I, I will skip. It has, also, it has also an, an impact on, on uh, real estate wealth and, and rents, but I will skip that for, for more clarity. So the next issue that I would like to, to present to you is that not all monetary policy are equivalent in terms of inequality. And for that, just give, I'll just give you an example of with two representative agents. One agent which has a low income and no wealth, so basically depending on wages and one uh, representative agent with a high income, a lot of wages and some financial income, which, which match a bit the picture that uh, Mr. Constancio gave us about the Euro with the exception that I don't take into account here people that are living out of pension fund, for example. Um, so how does a, a conventional monetary policy affect uh, th these people? So, a conventional monetary policy is a decrease in interest rates, if you want to be expansionary. When you decrease interest rates, you decrease financial income. So you decrease income from high income people. But again, you have an indirect impact on this stimulates the, the economy. And that has an indirect impact um, uh, on, on, on wages. It increases wages. And what we know historic historically is such policies have a bigger impact on low income, especially because they reduce unemployment. So all in all, this uh, conventional monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy decreases inequality because they boost wages of low income more than high income and they also have a, quite an, a negative impact on financial income. So that's a decrease in inequality. Now, for large case asset purchases, quantitative easing, unconventional monetary, monetary policy, it works a bit differently. Again, you, it's quantitative easing and unconventional monetary policy also in, imply a decrease in interest rate, same as before. But what I differ a bit from what was presented before is that quantitative easing also has an impact in, in, in inflating stock prices. And, and we, we can discuss how much they, they do it, if it's big or not, but they do that. So, so potentially, that's also an increase in financial income. If people 
realize their capital gain that certainly financial income. And that's an effect that didn't exist with conventional monetary policy. And what we also know is that from experience is that uh, quantitative easing tend to boost wages more at the top than at, at the bottom. Uh, so there are, there are evidence on that. We can also discuss if it's, if it's big or not, but it's not as clear as for conventional monetary policy where there it was clearly low income wages that were winning. So all in all, uh, conventional monetary policy uh, expansionary decrease in equality for quantitative easing uh, and, and unconventional monetary policy, the empirical estimation are not clear cut. There are a lot of studies that also mention an increase. So, so what we know is that it generates an, in, an increase in wealth inequality. But, uh, but in, in income inequality, it's less clear, but uh, it's, it, there is some potential and some studies showing that it, it actually increases inequality. But the point is just to show you that two different monetary policy can have very different impacts on, on, on inequality. And just to show you other numbers, that is monetary policy in the UK between 2017 and 2014. And that's a combination of a decrease in interest rate and quantitative easing. And, and the Bank of England computed its own uh, estimation of the impact on, on, uh, on, on different households. And of course, on average, people have gained from monetary policy. So monetary policy made their situation better. But when you when you decrease when you when you you split that into quantile, and that's on Bank of England estimation, you can see the the, the tiny uh, black squares that the total effect. So you see that they have a much positive much more positive effect on a high income than on low income. In that case, I don't know if it exactly the same thing uh, in the in your area. Everything depends on the context anyway. But what we can see here is that for the first two decile, actually the, there were no positive impact and even a small, small uh, a negative impact on, 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 the, on, the, on the first quintile. So this is equivalent to a regressive fiscal policy. When, if you speak in terms of fiscal policy, this is a regressive policy. So now facing all this effect, what is, what, monetary policy should, uh, should the central bank choose. And I'm not now comparing quantitative easing versus uh, conventional monetary policy, but trying to think about what, what is the best monetary policy that, that um, a central bank can choose given uh, uh, its, in, its impacts for inequality. So again, I'm, I'm just concentrating on a central bank that tried to manage inflation and a central bank that have better control on demand than on supply, as it is the case for most central banks. So what central bank do there is basically it has to stimulate demand, and that means generating a, an income effect, an income increase, at least temporary, uh, to households so that they can they can uh, spend more and increase demand. Now, what do we know about how people spend their money? Uh, what we know is that for one additional euro, for example, a low income um, household will spend more out of it directly. So the marginal propensity to consume decreases with, with, with income. So rich people, if you give them one more euro, they're going to spend less out of it than, than, than low income households. So if a central bank want to stimulate uh, demand and through a, a, an increase in income or nominal increase in income, it must make sure that its monetary policy also reaches low income people because that's where, that's what, that would stimulate demand much more than if, it, if it's only re reaches uh, high income people. So ideally, um, we the, the monetary policy should focus on, on low income uh, household to be efficient, or at least be equal. 
But if you focus on, on, on high income households, then you lose efficiency because you have to, to generate much more uh, income effect to, to, for the same amount of, uh, of aggregate demand uh, boost. So, and, and, and what we know also is that low income households highly rely on, on, uh, on wages. So basically, if a central bank want to use uh, want to, to, to boost demand and um, through low income, it has to go through the, through the job market, through labor market. It has to stimulate wages, it has to reduce unemployment. And that's a sound monetary policy for central banks because by that, if, if you can reach, if you can stimulate unemployment and, um, and, uh, and, and low wages, then you have a much bigger impact on, 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 on aggregate demand and then, and then also a bigger impact on inflation. Now, so basically what I'm trying to say is that a good monetary policy, and not for, for the sake of being nice, but for, for the sake of doing, doing a good job and, 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 and an efficient job, should uh, focus on employment and low wages. And that's a step that the Fed has started to do recently by uh, putting more emphasis on, on their unemployment mandate than on the inflation. And I think that's a good step. Now, the, the, the question is more, how will, will they do that? How will they uh, you know, uh, focus and, and have an impact on, on employment and wages? And here I would like to, to bring a few proposition for a central bank that would like to focus on, on, on low wages. Uh, one, the first one is really staying in what central bank do now. What central bank do now is to target, is to, to buy uh, corporate bonds, for example. But what we've seen is that a lot of this uh, money injected in, in corporate bonds is then reused to buy back shares and not to invest at all. So their central bank could be a bit more targeted, a bit more selective and, and target uh, assets and firms that are actually investing in human capital and not just using the money for something else. Uh, the Bank of Japan is doing something similar. They, they dedicate a share of their purchases to firms that are proven to uh, increase employment and increase wages. So they, they look at which firms have uh, a good record in, in employment and wages and they invest more in them. So that, that's a, a possibility. Another possibility to reach uh, low-income households is to go through, uh, through fiscal or uh, uh, through, through public spending. Um, so by supporting public spending uh, in, in human capital and, and social safety nets, then uh, central banks do, uh, do also reach these households. And that's actually what they are already doing now. So since, since the crisis now they're buying sovereign bonds. So they either directly like, like for the Bank of England or indirectly like the ECB, they do support uh, public spending. So if this public spending is also by coincidence targeting or benefiting low-income households, then indirectly this helps monetary policy. Now, of course, this is conditioned on how uh, the public sector spend his money. If the, the public sector spend it in, in, in useless projects which don't bring jobs, then this would not transmit monetary policy very well. So to cope with that, to this possibility of non-transmission, a uh, central bank could also think about financing uh, sovereign funds or funds that are as specifically investing in human capital, that are specifically investing in in, in project treating job, long-term job and, and, and supporting wages. Um, they could use what is existing now, like the ECB could, for example, uh, sort of support or give more funding to the uh, European Investment Bank, which has such, such program of, of, uh, of boosting, boosting the economy and, and, uh, and uh, reducing unemployment. So instead of going through the state, they could go through, through specific funds that are dedicated, that would ensure them to really reach what they want to achieve. 
And last but not least, <laughs> that has to come when you speak about inequality in central banks, there is helicopter money. I mean, the best way to circumvent financial market or other public institution is to give cash directly to the household. Uh, and I mean, this is the most direct way to control precisely aggregate demand, but it requires a, a quite fundamental shift in the in current central bank practices and framework. That's something new, but that's something, that's something uh, everyone should, should, should uh, every central banker, I think, should consider as, as, as an option and not put that on the side. So, so to, con to conclude, I would say that I think that central banks should not shy away from the distribu distributional impact. They have a distributional impact, and, and that's a fact. They cannot avoid it. But I think they can use it better to achieve their imp inflation mandate. They can, they, they can uh, uh, like redistrib redistribute um, wealth and, and, and income as they do it now, anyway, but they can target it to where it's more efficient for, for, for their own mandate. And, and this would require, in my opinion, to choose um, policies that give a higher priority in supporting employment and low wages, because that's where uh, you have the most, the, the, more, the biggest impact on, on, uh, on aggregate demand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre Monin, for uh, this insightful presentation. So I think we've, we've definitely saw uh, both sides of the of the table here in a way. Um, monetary policy can do to do uh, to tackle inequality and uh, how it possibly affects inequality. Um, I'm going to try to sort of act as the advocate of the audience here a little bit and um, look at which uh, questions and comments have been been raised. Uh, so I have one opening question I want to kind of relate to to Mr. Consancio that's uh, coming from myself, but then also one comment that was raised and voted here quite a bit, and that did. Um, wonder me as well in your presentation, Mr. Constantia, maybe you can uh, relate to that briefly. Uh, you showed that slide with the increase in percent of wealth, which is obviously a difference if you're looking at very rich people and uh, their um, income or their wealth is increasing by 1%. That's a very big difference to if you're looking at the lowest uh, quintile, for example. So this difference between 2.5% and 1% really in real terms is something else. I um, I just wanted to relate that. Uh, we can look at the slide again as well, but maybe you can you can comment on that. It was right, you, you don't have to, or if you want, you can open it. It's right at the beginning, I think. I was rather at the beginning, I think. No, it's not that one. It's the, um, it had like a bar graph. Yeah, further on the, I think two slides up or three. No, I think even further up, but we don't have to look at it right now. But the point was basically, you don't, you don't even have to comment if you don't want to, but the point was that a percent in cha a change in, in wealth is sort of a difference than, than a real change. And uh, you're still muted. You, you are still, still on mute right now. There we yeah, go. I am. I am now unmuted. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I insisted in showing this slide because that's uh, what uh, counts. Uh, we cannot really look to assess distribution, which is about relative positions, uh, to just compare uh, absolute changes uh, in the different segments of the population. In this, in this case, four quartiles. The uh, highest quartile increases seven times more than the lowest uh, uh, quartile. But to calculate any of the measures that is universally used to assess the degree of equality or inequality of a distribution, uh, what counts is what were the variations in percentage. Uh, as I show on the right, simple measures of the relative positions of the uh, distribution, the ratio between the top and the lowest uh, 
segment where it improves uh, uh, in spite of the absolute variations. The Gini coefficient, which is also universally used, also decreases uh, in the second moment. Uh, it's perhaps puzzling uh, because it is very impressive that the highest uh, quartile increases by more than seven times uh, the income or wealth of the lowest quintile, but the distribution improves uh, by any measure, including what Piketty okay. is, is very much. And uh, we don't we don't have to go into the super no, detail we don't have, here. It's just uh, it's just uh, like that. Uh, Perhaps if, as you are moderating, I would like to say something about helicopter money at a certain point in time because I forgot to address absolutely that, uh, I, I, uh, in my presentation. But okay, it's up to you. Maybe we I, there's a lot of questions on that in the chat. Maybe we start with something a little bit easier and then we, we move on to that a little bit later because that's obviously a very controversial uh, topic. Um, Mr. Monan mentioned that in his presentation that uh, the Fed has uh, started to focus a little more on their employment uh, mandate or for a lot more, one could say. Um, they're starting with this um, so-called average inflation targeting and saying and, and forward guidance and really saying that um, they will wait until they can see employment recover until they start um, adjusting rates. Is this something that um, if yeah. there was a mandate, is the, um, the ECB could, for example, focus on as well? No, well, I, have, I have tweeted. Uh, would you mind uh, um, stopping the screen sharing? Then we can all see each other. Oh, yes, yes, easier. yes. Okay. Sorry, there you go. No, I, I have tweeted many times uh, in favor uh, of the ECB copying the uh, average inflation targeting that the Fed has introduced. It cannot be equal because the ECB has no dual mandate, but it can be done uh, and should be done in terms of the definition of the target. And I mentioned that in the, my last uh, slide precisely uh, because it's essential uh, going forward in the next years that uh, if inflation increases a little bit for reasons of supply chains being damaged or pent up demand suddenly materializing, uh, central banks have to be relaxed and condone that increase in uh, prices uh, uh, without introducing restrictive policies, which should be very detrimental to uh, employment uh, uh, and so on. So I fully agree uh, with that. Uh, and that's why uh, personally I am in favor of dual mandates because it facilitates uh, much more to manage uh, this uh, thing uh, than just having an inflation targeting, but it's the treaty, as you know. Uh, and uh, well, I have really no hopes in my lifetime that the treaty will be changed on that uh, aspect. Thank you very much. Pierre, do you want to join in? Just, just on that point, I think, I think it's fine to have a dual mandate. Uh, it's, it's, it's even better if you interpret it well. Um, the Fed has, has had a dual mandate forever, uh, but they were putting much more emphasis on inflation for some time than, than now. And I think that what they're doing now is the right step. And I, I particularly like the fact that, you know, they're not going to, according to what they say, it's not going to preempt an increase in, infl in inflation by, by cutting rate before. Yeah. So they really now wait to see Okay, there, there are movement in inflation, there are real movement in wages, and they are looking at wages, I think. And then if we see that, then we can act. So yeah. I, I, th I think that's this way of doing uh, is also something that the ECB, uh, although they don't have dual mandate, but this way of thinking is also not be too preemptive, and preemptive because what, what we see is that um, Central banks increase rates, and, and we never see a, a little bit of inflation because they do it in advance. And, and that might, you know, this, this shift of, of waiting a bit before something else. Oh, it, it's part, yeah, if I may, it's part of the averaging inflation target regime that they have introduced. And as I said, I am in favor of the uh, ECB adopting uh, the same. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, problem uh, for in the last 10 years has not been that the central banks are preempting uh, by increasing rates because we have had so uh, low inflation below the target of central banks, which is already quite small, uh, that uh, that was uh, not indeed the problem. The problem now for the next few years uh, is that after COVID uh, is totally uh, you know, um, solved, 
then there may be indeed a little bit more a measured inflation, not an inflationary process, but uh, measured inflation, price spikes, because demand for certain things suddenly increases, uh, supply side is damaged by uh, these crises, uh, all that can lead to price spikes, but not an inflationary process. And so the central banks have to say, ignore uh, those increases in the measured inflation, otherwise they can jeopardize a more robust uh, uh, recovery uh, and would lead to maintain the scars that this crisis leaves behind uh, in our economies and our society indeed. Yeah. Can I just jump on that because yeah. as you as you as you you mentioned the problem now is not inflation is is deflation now it's it's of threat of deflation and and that leads me to helicopter money since you wanted uh, to address it. I mean, why? Yeah. I mean, why not thinking about uh, money injection that way? Because that would definitely, uh, you know, restart uh, aggregate demand and, and, and starting infl inflationary pressure. And mm -hmm. if you if you do it well, I, I think you you can you don't you don't go to to hyperinflation, but you can. Yeah. Well, uh, the problem there uh, is twofold. Uh, first, it has to do uh, with the, the choice between the central bank doing it or the uh, fiscal authority. Because it's really uh, about distribution. Think about it, that central banks, what do central banks do? They lend uh, primary liquidity that they create to the financial institutions and when they purchase assets, financial assets, they also issue this primary liquidity. So the only thing that they buy is securities. Uh, they don't buy goods. So they don't affect demand directly, but indirectly by the, in, by the decline in the cost of capital. And by the way, uh, you refer to QE as if it was a very special thing. It is not in, that, in this respect because what QE does is decreasing directly the medium term rates, interest rates, where before conventional policy acted only on the short end of the maturities. Now it affects directly. But what it does is improving or reducing the cost of capital is the same type of effect as conventional monetary policy. Uh, and that's what QE does. But going back to, uh, uh, to the helicopter money, Helicopter money has been done uh, in Hong Kong, in the US now, to, uh, once and now twice is coming, but done by the treasury, uh, precisely, distributing those checks. For the central bank to uh, take that initiative, well, there are many lawyers uh, that say it's not, it's against the treaty, that the, the central bank would embark into such a function that it's not uh, really in the, uh, in, in, in the mandate or the instruments that are foreseen uh, in the treaty. But leaving that aside, if a central bank would uh, uh, create money and distribute directly money to uh, citizens, uh, what would happen to the balance sheet of the uh, central bank? Uh, for the central bank to do that, it would be uh, uh, immediate decrease in the capital of central banks. It is true, uh, it is, because there is nothing on the other side of the balance sheet, it's just the issuance of money on one side. So the capital will, would be depleted. And it is true that central banks can work with negative capital, absolutely. But, but there is, as you well know, a political economy problem there because if a central bank goes into a very negative capital, the uh, confidence on the currency, uh, it's armed. The population in general doesn't understand that, uh, you know, a powerful central bank has no capital uh, and so on and so on. So these issues are real. Uh, these issues are real. And uh, then the other thing is the central bank could only uh, do that by, um, you know, uh, giving to the banks, the 
sort of order providing the liquidity for the banks to credit the deposit accounts uh, of their clients. Is this possible to respect a level playing field there? Many persons have several deposits in, in different banks. That is not controlled because there is no database and should not exist a central database. I didn't would have to be coordinated with fiscal authorities, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it... that's right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm going uh, precisely. Only the treasury has a database that takes into account the uh, income of uh, different citizens that declare uh, that the, for, for, for tax purposes, because not everyone declares uh, there is a general obligation, but okay. Uh, but only the treasury has, has that. Uh, and so again, it's something that you, requires this intervention of the treasury, which then also what would be the main way would be for the treasury to issue a console to the central bank that would be on the other side of the balance sheet just to satisfy the conventions of uh, accounting. But uh, uh, so indeed, it's a difficult proposition for central banks to take that uh, initiative. That's nothing against the uh, uh, helicopter money or distribu direct distribution of money to citizens. Although again, there is there a question of uh, uh, fairness and uh, distribution. Mm, but can I can I follow up on one point there? Just oh, sure. I would really be interested in your uh, opinion there on. Um, yeah. So I mean, what what Mr. Monan put in his presentation was basically saying that we have a, a higher propensity to spend with lower income households. So if you actually target and if you were doing this in this ex, in this mind experiment, yeah, yeah, yeah. then um, you would raise inflation right away or uh, by by a lot more than you're doing right now with this unconventional um, policies that we're seeing with this QE and you're, where you're arguably targeting um, a different group or a different quintile, if you want to put it that way. And do, do you agree with that? I mean, with the mechanism behind it? Oh, Could yeah, it the work? The mechanism, yes, absolutely. It, 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 it would work that way, but to keep it in a significant uh, amount uh, over a period of time to, throughout the recovery to feed the recovery, it would have to spend a lot of money because it's just not, you know, sending everyone uh, $2,000 uh, with a check, which the uh, US is doing. That's, you know, it has that effect uh, on impact, but then it is spent and it's over. So it's not a permanent, uh, permanent thing. It's not a permanent uh, policy uh, in this respect, or it would have then to attain very high levels of uh, the uh, uh, GDP to have that sort of effect. There is that difficulty. And then there is the difficulty of how to uh, really be fair in distributing these. For instance, the US is now sending, uh, you know, $2,000 uh, uh, to each citizen who has family income below $125,000 per year. Well, you know, many of uh, people uh, around that level are employed, don't need the $2,000 at all, and perhaps will not spend it uh, on whatever, will save them and so on. So the efficiency of such a policy has problems and the fairness of that policy has uh, problems. Uh, so it's a difficult thing to implement, but it has that effect. It could be done by, by the treasuries, it has been done by the treasuries uh, around the world to have central banks to do that on a sort of, uh, you know, continuing basis. Uh, it's uh, it's very problematic uh, uh, for the central banks to take the initiative would be a big ask uh, of legal terms uh, inclusive. So that's, you know, on a nutshell, what I think uh, about the policy that, you know, makes that sense as being on impact more expansionary then what central banks can do which, which is just to reduce the cost of capital and, and, and finance and wait that economic agents spend more as a result. So it's an indirect thing, yes. The other thing is more direct on impact. So that is undisputable. Uh, but there are limitations to what can be done and certainly by the central banks. Do you want to join in, uh, Piamona? 
okay. there's a difference between. So I don't think it's the central bank who should manage the distribution. Ah. But what is important is how it is funded. So now the US are sending money, mm -hmm. but they have to take debt out of it to, to fund that. Yeah. I think one way would be for the central banks to finance the government for that, and then the government or the fiscal authority redistribute it. And that's very different. So it's not, a, not really a matter of how it is distributed, but how the money is generated. And, 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 and by the way, I don't know how it was for you at the ECB, but when I was working at the Swiss National Bank, I had a bank account at the Swiss National Bank. No, so you, you, you don't go, you don't no, go. That through. doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. Really? Okay. Well, and then it's different. But, but you know, you, 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 could, you, could, go, you could go um, aside the, the banking system if, if, you, if you have a, you know, or you just send a, a, credit, a, a credit card uh, or a, a, a card that is loaded with money, like a, a prepaid card. Can you imagine? I don't know. I'm, just I'm, I'm sure there are some technical costs of such an operation just for that purpose. I mean, we're here. We're here to imagine. I mean, yeah, we're, yeah, we're sure, talking about course. next course, generation right. central banking. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, of course, uh, I, I agree. But okay, it's it has been a good discussion. I, I find maybe a different area that we can yeah. um, jump to. So I have a couple more questions related to other options, what central banks could do and um, where, where they could be active, but a couple others, which were um, still related to the to the presentation. Maybe I'll just refocus there for a minute. Um, someone was asking on um, basically the, the role of um, of house prices and uh, how they have increased because we kind of focused on on stock prices quite a bit and um, how that the, that channel kind of works with uh, with quantitative easing, but also house prices have increased quite a bit and, and that sort of has an effect on on inequality. Maybe you can comment a little more on that. I know there was some uh, parts of that in the uh, presentations as well. And then uh, there's a question by Jan that, who asked um, if asset inflation. Um, is asset inflation a problem that central banks need to address given the perpetual increase in the money supply? Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll relate these two a little more technical questions again and then jump back to, to things that central banks could be doing. Well, if I may start then. Uh, on, on the second question, um, uh, how monetary policy affects then the housing prices, which are important as I try to show in the wealth distribution in view of the big size of housing and real estate in the wealth of people, uh, even the middle class, which, uh, you know, it's the main component of their wealth is that. Now it's through again, uh, interest rates. Uh, and again, it's, uh, you know, conventional policy uh, starts by affecting interest rates in the lower maturities. QE does that uh, in longer maturities. Uh, and all that uh, and other aspects of uh, the central banks providing liquidity to the banks leaves, leads to the banks to decrease the interest rates used to finance uh, housing. So there is then a credit boom. You see again, uh, even during this crisis, housing prices are increasing, both in the US, uh, a lot in the US, and also uh, visibly uh, in Europe right now during during this crisis because precisely interest rates have become so low that people try to take advantage uh, of that uh, to buy houses and we are seeing uh, you know house prices uh, increasing and then the whole question for distribution is uh, the the fact that the stocks prices have increased more that's true but the share of those <laughs> stock uh, prices uh, portfolios in the overall composition of wealth is you know small compared with the size of housing so it may happen during certain periods or using models trying to measure what will be the impact during a, a period of time of a monetary policy shock on those prices it may be then then the result is that by the fact that housing prices are also increasing significantly the overall effect on the wealth distribution is to improve it uh, and not uh, despite the bigger increase in stock prices 
And we have to uh, have these uh, into account. As I say, may not happen uh, all the time, uh, may not happen always, uh, but it may happen. Uh, and what has to be measured is by, you know, econometric uh, methods, uh, which are not perfect at all, to say the least, but it is to try to measure what is, what is the quantitative impact of the monetary policy on those prices, because those prices move for many reasons, not just because of monetary policy. Uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe I can add in one little uh, extra question that came in the audience uh, for your response to Mr. Wanan, and then you can uh, add on to that as well. Um, Stan Jordan asks, uh, how about the effect of central bank policies on intergenerational inequality? So low interest rates benefit some generations more than others. And this also really affects real estate. And then if real estate is already really, really high right now, it might be harder to, to buy houses now for someone like me uh, at the beginning of his thirties than in comparison to my, my parents, for example. Yeah. Can I just, just comment on, on, on that related to, to real estate? I think you know, um, expansionary monetary policy or lower interest rates <clears throat> tend to raise housing price. And, and, and that could be a good thing because as, as uh, Mr. Consorcio showed, a lot of wealth of, of the middle, middle um, class people, that's their house. So it, in a sense, it seems a good thing to, to have increasing food prices, but in terms of intergenerational uh, inequality, that's a problem because it's much more difficult for young people now to enter this type of, of wealth than, than it was before. And I'm in Switzerland, I'm, I'm well known to know that here the prices, are, the real estate prices are very, very high and a lot of, uh, more, most young people cannot afford a house. So they will never enter this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, wealth possibility. Then second, it's nice to have a house where you live, which has more value, but concretely, it's the same house as before, where housing prices can also lead to more inequality is when you have people that have secondary houses that they rent. And this, when, when, they, when they can rent, then they get more, more, more rents, more income. Whereas if it's only your own house, it doesn't really matter if the price goes up or down because you use it for living and that will not change. So you never kind of realize this, this capital gain. Yeah, that's and, true. And, and on one, one, but, one point on, on Stan Jordan's remark, sure. I think what is very important is, and Mr. Consorcio also showed it, in the poorest quintile, you have a lot of people living on rents. On, so, on pensions. So, on pension, sorry, uh, the yeah, pension. Sorry. So, so for them, the interest rate do matter a lot. So they are better. They are better with a higher interest rate. So they are in in in, in kind of the the, the, the the poorest segment or the low income segment. You have two type of people. You have you have pensioners and people with low wages. And for them, the inter the, the movement of the interest is a, a, has different effects. It's good. It's good for them if it raises for pension for people living from pension, but it's bad for for people living out of work. So there you have you have a tension with uh, with my trade policy. Yeah, there are two aspects there. Uh, one is the effect on the wealth distribution. The other is the effect on the income distribution. What you mentioned about secondary houses and uh, that uh, they can increase the rents. Uh, and then they heard something out of it and uh, the others don't. That is picked up, uh, as I showed in the, the composition of uh, uh, income. There is there a big chunk, uh, a visible chunk on the uh, uh, composition of income of the top uh, uh, quintile there of rental income. And so that effect would be shown in this rental income. But on the wealth, well, it's just the stock. So on the wealth, it's the value of what you have. So uh, indeed, what counts there is that if the housing prices have increased, uh, you know, your house values more. If you ever have to sell it or to mortgage, uh, you know, you can get more. Uh, so one thing is wealth distribution. The other thing is income. But that is counted on, on precisely that uh, element of rental income 
in the income composition of the different quintiles. Uh, and that is important only on the top uh, quintile, uh, precisely as, uh, as you mentioned. Regarding pensions, again, it's mixed. Because uh, if you have a pension which is defined benefit, uh, then lower interest rates are good for you because uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, even incurring credit uh, and so on, whatever, and you have the same pension because you have a defined benefit uh, uh, pension, which is related to uh, your income before retirement. If you are in a scheme of defined contribution, uh, then, of course, the uh, lower interest rates affect the return that uh, at each moment can be obtained uh, with, you know, investments uh, in financial uh, assets uh, or whatever. So that, uh, indeed, it has that, uh, that effect. Uh, but it's then what it is. Uh, but it's different uh, according to the different regimes uh, of, uh, uh, of pensions. So uh, I don't agree entirely what what you said that low interest rates because they somehow increase housing prices make more difficult access for young generations to uh, to uh, to housing. Uh, you know, uh, with higher interest rates, also young people could have to have down payments normally provided by the families. Well, it continues to be the same. And they can go in long, uh, you know, loans, 30 years, yeah, that is done. Uh, and what they have to pay going forward is much lower because of the inter low interest rates. Uh, yes, they have to have some help at the beginning in a down payment. But uh, indeed, uh, if anything, what we see now, and it's part of what is going on, with the increase in housing prices is because younger people is bu uh, are buying houses. Uh, you know, otherwise you, you wouldn't see this develop in the market. It's new couples, new people that, uh, you know, need uh, their own house after leaving home and, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, increased demand uh, for houses. So uh, on the whole, uh, normally, normally what uh, the effect is, by the way, the stronger effect of interest rates on types of expenditure is precisely in housing purchases, more than on investment uh, or business investment or what or other type of expenditures. The big response, the bigger response of uh, uh, reduction in interest rates is in housing the credit. That's the biggest uh, response. So that's what happens uh, in this regime of low rates where we are because you know, we are in a regime of low inflation for many reasons, and it's not. Uh, one thing that also should be dispelled is this idea that central banks control inflation fully and can put inflation at whatever level they, 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 they want. Well, for 12 years, it's not true, and it's not true. Uh, so we have to uh, vary monetarism uh, of... Uh, Friedman, uh, once and for all, we have enough evidence that it doesn't work that way. Maybe we, we can address that again and sort of revisit uh, one of the topics that was raised in, in Mr. Wana's presentation, um, which was how monetary policy is transmitted and how monetary policy works. So right now, what we're seeing, and I think the, the presentation sort of illustrated that really well, is that you're trying to, central banks are trying to raise demand or stimulate demand in some way to um, to create inflation and to, to thereby create a price um, price stability. And, and, and you said yourself and, and, that it's not really work or hasn't necessarily worked um, as, as you thought it might. And uh, quantitative easing is sort of a very controversial topic because no one seems to understand 100% on how what works and what it what it does but somehow it does work in, in in a way and i would like to move forward to something else to to kind of get get the discussion from from the audience back in and to actually kind of hear the thoughts because one of the ideas that, that you have is okay how can you work um how can you implement monetary policy sort of around uh, financial markets and one of the things that we talked about already at the beginning is, is helicopter money and um 
in a direct uh, transfer to to a citizen's bank account. So, but there are other options also, right? I mean, with someone I kind of focused on it and said, hey, you could possibly um, create a, a wealth fund of some sorts. Um, I personally have read a, a suggestion or a proposal where, which was about focusing on these um, credit finance institutions. So like the, the EIB, the European Investment uh, bank, I think is, is what it's called, that could, could, for example, create this project. Let's say we're trying to, we're talking about these trans, uh, transformational issues right now. Let's try and build a, a railway or something, some, some massive infrastructure project in Europe. And then these are bonds where the ECB could, could invest. I mean, that would directly target the, uh, the real economy and, and go into investment and thereby also in, increase um, inflation, wouldn't it? And it would also help um, target this towards towards transformational change and not just kind of um, get suckered into the financial market and then nobody really knows where it goes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it, it's happening because for many years now, the, uh, the uh, ECB granted access to uh, liquidity provision to the European Investment Bank. So it accepts uh, the uh, debt, the bonds issued by the European Investment Bank to finance their investments and projects, uh, accepts that uh, as collateral to provide liquidity and the European Investment Bank has access to that. It's also part of the uh, program of purchasing of, uh, of bonds, right? <coughs> the sent to the uh, ECB, <coughs> sorry, is buying bonds of the EIB, of the European Investment Bank, for years now. I mean, since since the program started. So if they issue more, yeah, the ECB will buy more uh, and, uh, and will uh, get, provide access to liquidity provision to the uh, European Investment Bank. So the limitation, the limitation of the European Investment Bank uh, is the following. They is that more of a political problem then? Like, no, no, it's not the... a political problem. It's a problem of capital and insurance of bonds in the market. So to keep a AAA rating, they have to have their own balance sheet with enough capital and, and so on and so on to prove that they can repay uh, in the future the bonds. And the capital is provided by the countries and the countries don't want to uh, increase the capital of uh, the uh, European Investment Bank by much more. Um, so that uh, that and the objective of keeping the triple rating limits the capacity of the European Investment Bank to expand its programs. But if it would expand its programs, the ECB would buy the bonds and would also uh, provide access to liquidity provision. It's already happening. Yeah. But in, in that case, couldn't the, the ECB, you know, if the ECB buys more of these bonds, that would kind of support also the rate, the rating of the EIB. I mean, you know, by, by buying Italian bonds or, or other bonds, that they, the ECB also support the rating of, of some rates. So if, if, no, if no, it's no. the EIB that, that, that fund, if it's the ECB that fund the EIB, that might not be a problem in terms of losing your rating. Well, I, I don't know of them the percentages of uh, what the CCB has purchased of the IB bonds. But it has purchased the uh, bonds. It could purchase more, uh, absolutely. Uh, and that affects the yields of those bonds. Uh, but there is the balance sheet limitation and the capital. So that's uh, another limitation for the rating and for access to the market of the European investment bank. So that would not go away. Okay, so there just seems to be um, unity on, on the idea that there could be uh, could be more done there, but obviously you're still kind of um, or we are still in the world where, where monetary financing is is not allowed to the yeah it's not allowed it's not allowed by the treaty I mean uh, and uh, can you uh, can you imagine believing that the treaty will be changed on that uh, respect? Well, I don't believe it. While we're already in this sort of deep into the discussion, maybe I'll just enter this this point because someone, uh, um, Daniela Gabo is also a, a researcher who we've worked with in this in this conference. Yeah, yeah, she's, well. 
Yeah, she wrote a paper um, just just for this conference, basically, and, and or, or used it as an opportunity to launch it. Where she said, "Okay, this this monetary financing that we're that we've been talking about, this is sort of already happening. I mean, this is you you might have had this in before the '70s and before Friedman, and you said, okay, back then it was sort of a active uh, fiscal policy. You had an active state that used." Um, low interest rates to to make these investments, sort of what I was pitching earlier with um, with investing into um, the European Investment Bank. Um, but right now, we are also seeing that the ECB's balance sheet is growing substantially and um, and increasing substantially with uh, sovereign debt. And so you already have, or you could argue there is already a sovereign, uh, sorry, monetary uh, financing going on. But um, for different reasons, because the reason is trying to um, stabilize the, the financial markets and this government debt uh, that is being used as collateral in every financial transaction is, um, I mean, I would be really interested to, to hear your thoughts on this. Well, the central banks uh, in the past, well, we would have to go back uh, a lot to find uh, examples of direct financing by the central bank uh, to the state. Well, in the 19th century, yes, uh, it happened. It also, one can say, it happened also in some European countries um, before the First World War and before the hyperinflation in Germany. Yes, it happened. But the consequences uh, were not uh, pleasant uh, always uh, as a result of since then, there is no monetary financing in the proper sense of the word. Uh, it is true that it can be uh, approximated to that, the fact that central banks now are buying a lot in the secondary market of uh, uh, government debt and are holding a lot of the government uh, debt in their, uh, um, uh, in their balance sheet. But there are differences though, that debt continues to be counted as debt of the treasury of the state. And the treasury has to pay to the central bank the interest and then the amortizations of that debt. So that is also then registered there, does not disappear. Whereas in a pure monetary financing, no, it's just the central bank uh, uh, provides the direct financing and that's it. There is no formalizing debt uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the state. Although economically, yeah. uh, you know, um, yeah. there is uh, this, uh, there are also effects, uh, and uh, uh, so there is a difference. But it is it is absolutely uh, important to underline that this sort of uh, collaboration between fiscal and monetary policy is huh. necessary in situations like the one we have now, uh, which a huge shock very low inflation, uh, no inflation in sight, uh, and the need to respond to this type of crisis of the COVID to really spend much more to increase, you know, public expenditures to uh, protect the population. So uh, um, this collaboration uh, is uh, necessary and justified, but it's not per se monetary financing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I actually just realized that we've already hit the the end of our time here. Uh, maybe we can ask both of you to for for a really quick statement. Um, if we were for some, uh, if you were to be able to change the the mandate, um, would employment be the first thing that you would in, would include? Well, I'm in favor of a dual mandate. So uh, yes, I I would uh, I would define a dual mandate like the Fed has. Uh, going for maximum employment uh, and uh, inflation uh, control um, uh, together. Okay, okay, how about you, Mr. Mona? Um, I mean, not, not sure you have to change the mandate. I think uh, it, it's a good thing to formalize it. I think what's more important is the way you interpret the mandate and the way you, you enact it. Yeah. Um, I think that the ECB can also yes, and uh, no. focus on employment to to reach a goal of, of inflation in a sense, but, but yes, uh, it's actually true that it would it would it would formalize it much 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 better. If, if you... Yeah, I agree. Formalizing it would be much better because it's not the same. You see, it's the same when inflation is very low, and because then the two objectives work together, converge, no problem. Yeah. 
<laughs> let's push employment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no problem there. But then there are other periods where the two conflict. And that's, yeah. where, that's where the dual mandate protects more uh, employment in that uh, circumstance. So it's different to have it formalized or not. Thank you so much, uh, Vito Constancio and Pierre Monin for diving deep with us on monetary policy and inequality. That was super insightful. Um, since we are in this sort of virtual environment, um, we have created one uh, opportunity for everyone that wants to still talk um, monetary policy. We provide a little mingle room, which is basically a virtual room where you can join. You have this little, make this little avatar of yourself and walk around and kind of find a coffee chat. And uh, once you meet another person, you, you jump into a video conversation. Uh, absolutely no must, but uh, for people that still want to, you can join there. And again, yeah, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a good, good rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah.